Hello everyone for whoever is here. I'm inviting Berenice to join us. Here she is. <laughs> oh, we made it. Okay, so we made it on time. We have still one minute before people join. I think it's just you and I anyway. No, we, we have Roman, Roman, maybe. <laughs> ah. Roman. Welcome. Why is it that I'm so technically challenged? <laughs> it's, um, you cannot be good at everything, they say, right? <laughs> oh, thank you. Very sweet. <laughs> Very sweet. So we're going to start, right? Hi, Berenice. Hi, Ev. Hello. My pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just you and I in my suite. Well, there's Rhonda. Ah, Hi, Rhonda. Hello. <laughs> All right. So shall we start, even though it's just us for now? That's okay. Now we have two people watching, or maybe just one. It doesn't matter. Yes, it doesn't matter. We have to go for it. So, okay. This is our tribe talk with, in this case, Berenice Smiles or that I tend, to, I tend to call you B. It's a very bad or a good habit. I'm not sure what it is. Hey, May. <laughs> so B is a, oh, hi, May. Um, B, Berenice is a yoga therapist. She specialized in stress, anxiety, and food disorders. Mm. Um, and today, we're going to talk about stress and anxiety specifically, how it affects us, why it comes to us, and uh, how to deal with it. That's it. So, yeah. Berenice, to start with, what I would like to do is to ask you what was your own journey and how you found yoga therapy, how you got there, why, and pretty much why you're here today doing what you do best <laughs> all right um well thank you for having me first and um it's been a journey i was not always a yogi i was not always into holistic healing and i was not into healing at all i was 25 and i thought i was fine because on the outside i had everything you know i ticked the boxes but inside i was just dying literally i felt depressed i felt anxious and at that time I didn't know I had anxiety so um, I had eating disorders so anorexia bulimia over exercising and I just hit rock bottom I was living in uh, Sweden and I realized that something had to change so I just made a change you know I started to recover from eating disorders and long story short eating disorder was just the top of the iceberg, you know, and the rest was just anxiety, PTSD, and a lot of other issues. So addressing first the eating disorders made me realize that I was suffering from stress and anxiety, and it was really ingrained within me. I had lived in fight or flight for almost 25 years, and it was really hard to come to this calm state. Hi, Prashant. Oh my God, we have someone from Rishikesh here. <laughs> Namaste. Namaste. So, as soon as I recovered from eating disorders and realizing that yoga was a huge stepping stone in the recovery, actually, I would say it was the first time I realized something was wrong with me. It was the first time I truly reconnected to my body and yoga started to be my daily practice mm. uh, to deal with the recovery to yo the yoga mat was my safe space where I could practice where I felt much better, you know. So I left my old life at uh, 25. I just felt so misaligned with it. I decided, okay, it's time to, to go for a change. I lost my job. So many events happened. 
And then I decided to go to Rishikesh, to India, um, to become a yoga teacher first. And that yeah. was not really my intention. So I was, let's discover India, Rishikesh, uh, where yoga is born, and, and just learn a bit more. And in Rishikesh, I just stayed longer. I met amazing people, including you. I came back to Europe and uh, there was no way I would go back to my quote-unquote old life because yeah. it didn't align with me anymore. And I knew that with my conditions, what I was going through, I could not go back to the nine to six and you know working all day and having pressure and so on. Yoga took a deeper meaning because for me it was healing. Thus, I wanted to share it with others. I wanted to help people also suffering and struggling uh, with yoga. So then came the yoga therapy education, uh, which happened in 2018. And uh, from there, I just started to share yoga more and more. And uh, I'm soon officially licensed as a yoga therapist. So that's very exciting. Yeah. What in this introduction is like, when did you start suffering from um, food disorder or actually bulimia and anorexia? How old were you? I was 16 years old. Yeah. 16 years old yes and then slowly you made your way into yoga and this is where you started to find some Relief. some peace i guess yeah. right but this is a very painful journey isn't it it is because i had so much resistance and i hated yoga the first time i went to my first yoga class it was just hell for me it was too slow it was called medi yoga so it was a very slow meditative yoga half an yeah. hour Mm. And I just felt I was dying. And at that time, I had the ego, you know, like the monkey mind, the voice in your head, whatever you call it, just screaming. And, you know, like I wanted to run away from the class because it was too slow. And the resistance, the, the resistance. very famous resistance that we found in yeah. any kind of illness. I'm and... I'm... <laughs> yeah, so the resistance was really strong and it didn't happen overnight. And that's what I tell people I work with, you know, like it's small change, it's consistency, it's daily steps every day. Just keep showing up, just keep doing it. Don't listen to the monkey mind, don't listen to the resistance because on the other side of resistance, there is a better way of feeling and being, so yeah. Yeah. Okay, I, I just want to ask you for those who don't know, uh, I think what we're going to do in this talk today is the following. I think you're going to explain to us, if you don't mind, what is yoga therapy as in different from yoga periods? Because very often I have patients myself who have real, you know, issues and I quote unquote prescribe yoga, but I realize that they are actually limited. It's almost like yoga is for the healthy kind of thing you know mm. if your body functions and everything is okay but you can hurt yourself quite easily so I'd like you to explain what is yoga therapy and then because this talk is very and specifically about stress and anxiety um, I would like us to go through what really is the definition of stress because we have an interesting uh, I was just reading the late this book by Gabor Maté that's called When the Body Says No. Yes, I know. You love the man. <laughs> and you're not the only one. We all kind of like feel like he's bringing something huge to the, the healing, you know, uh, our healing perspectives anyway. So I picked on a few things in his books which are very enlightening, I think, in terms of what really is stress and how we defined it. And, and then we are going to, um, you're going to explain to us how is your practice. I think that I would like to invite people as well to, to tell us, like, to ask us questions if they have any. Mm -hmm. And we will end this talk with a nice meditation, kind of a takeaway from you about how to deal with your stress and anxiety yeah. right a technique or something yeah. at the end and it's of something stuff. that you can bring today and just bring back to your life and do it it's just two minutes so yes, yes perfect it's the gift <laughs> it's the gift at the end of the the, the icing on, on the cake so tell us berenice about yoga therapy exactly and how does it work really um so i'm going to start by what yoga therapy is not because often i say oh you're a yoga teacher oh oh there's shubham here hi shubham <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it's not a yoga class 
uh, it's not talking therapy. I'm not a psychologist. Uh, yoga therapy is a way to help you on the mat, to give you the tools. So I'm not here to heal you. I'm not here to fix you. I just accompany you on the journey. I sort of hold your hand and I'm just a messenger from, well, whatever you believe in the universe or God, uh, to just empower you to find the tools within because everything is within, I think. Uh, you shouldn't rely on an external help, you know? Like, I mean, yes, it can help you, but in the end of the day, it's you doing the words. It's you deciding to get better. You would so be a facilitator, our... I guess. Yes, exactly. And using holistic tools such as yoga, breathing techniques, meditation. And sometimes, of course, like talking, you know, like uh, I'm listening to people, but I'm not like a typical uh, psychologist, you know, just listening to you. And I think that's the beauty of yoga therapy because it's really bridging back the mind and the body. Uh, yeah. Whereas Western medicine is really making this distinction, you know, like, oh, you have mental health. We just, you know, like, it feels like we're just going to deal with that here. Oh, you have physical issues. We're going to deal with the down. So, and yoga therapy has this beautiful concept of, you know, layers. It's called the koshas. And uh, each layer corresponds to something. So I'm not going to go too much into details because I think I'm going to lose people. But basically, it's uh, finding balance in all the layers of yourself so that you can find mental, physical, and emotional balance. So that's what yoga therapy is. And very practically, uh, what do you heal being... I mean, people, I guess, imagine that, you know, we deal with the lower back, the upper back, like, mm -hmm. you know, joints. So that's the physical part. Can you tell us what are the physical ailments you deal with, but also the emotional or yeah. Um, issues? Yeah, it was uh, three years of training, so I don't recall everything. <laughs> but um, we deal, yeah, of course, with the arthritis, uh, helping with the bone health, so anything with osteoporosis. And then, yeah, like pregnancy as well. So before the pregnancy, post-pregnancy, we help people with the uh, respiratory issues. Um, a great friend of mine, maybe she's watching, also helps people uh, who've had uh, COVID, you know, like long COVID. So yoga therapy can help for anything. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily for fit people. You know, that's the thing I, I really want you to understand if you're like looking at us right now. It's not, you know, you don't have to have the typical physical yogi body. And by the way, there is no such thing as the yoga body. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And uh, you can also, we, we also help people, you know, like who are disabled, who are in wheelchair, who cannot move, like chair yoga, it's something. Um, and then more emotional, mental issues. Of course, we help with depression, anxiety, trauma, um, PTSD, insomnia, helping with Alzheimer, not healing Alzheimer, one more time, you know, just uh, decreasing the symptoms. Um, yeah, addictions as well, so. Yes, it's, <laughs> yes, it's endless, it's really. So right. because the, the theme of today is um, stress and anxiety, what do we have to say about stress? Well, what is stress? Yes, stress, what is stress? Yeah, uh, stress. Well, it's, you know, we have stressors every day in life. We encounter things uh, happening from the moment you wake up. I mean, your alarm clock, you know, is a stressor in itself. Uh, yeah. To when you go to work, when you have duties, tasks to, to, to feel. And uh, it's also like things that happen in life, a divorce, uh, losing a loved one. Um, so that was the interesting issues. thing. Yeah. So like regarding that part, like this definition of stress, you know, I found it very interesting. Again, like Gabor Maté is mentioning this, that we see stress as an isolated event. Well, first of all, I think his whole reasoning and ours as well as holistic practitioner is very much about the fact that like you know traditional medicine not traditional but the medical current the current medical system sees illness illness as um you know kind of separated separating the mind and the body right still 
And we kind of like still do not believe entirely that our emotions are going to have some kind of impact on our bodily, you know, balance or imbalances really. So first of all, it's a question of assuming and deciding that actually it does. And, and we see stress seemingly as like, okay, stress is like when you lost loved ones or you lost a job or we believe stress comes from like a major event. But we realize at least in our practices of healing people that stress is more, much more insidious and stress is much more an everyday kind of uh, business. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think this is the crucial part about this. Um, don't you think? I mean, don't you? I mean, the, the people that you deal with are... It's, um, I think that they're intrinsically people more sensitive to stress. And it starts from early childhood, you know, and it really depends on the environment you grew up with and the parents you had. And I also believe that you inherit stress. So, okay, for example, my grandmother is like highly anxious, really. And my mom inherited it and I yeah. also inherited it. So it runs through family and it's something stress that we didn't talk that's about that's people. years ago. <laughs> yeah, that's Anxiety people. is the, yeah, vata vata all the way. So, yeah, it runs through family. It depends on how you grew up. And I feel that you grow up and then you put on these shields, you have these coping mechanisms that work until a certain time. Because the more you feel in the cup stress, the more it gets loaded. And at one point, it cannot hold the contain, you know, the stress anymore. And then it's overflowing. And that's often when burnout happens and also depression, because there's so much pressure you're holding. You know, and then psh, it releases and psh, depression, like the pressure is going off. So depression is not bad, actually. People like uh, believe it's, you know, evil. I would say stress is even worse because stress is the cause of depression most of the time. So um, stress, I would say, is interesting and people have different ways of coping with it. Uh, highly stressed and anxious people often have something else going on you know so as i said stress cohabits with uh, depression it also often cohabits with addictions because people use drugs alcohol food sex gambling whatever to deal with the stress to release the stress to numb the to numb the effect and exactly. to not have to yeah yeah and to not have to feel so stress is also in your body um, and that's when yoga therapy is really helpful because yoga brings you back to balance. And when I say yoga, I'm not talking about going to a yoga class to your studio, doing one hour of hot yoga and doing like 1,008 no. salutations. Like, no, this is not the yoga for stress. So one, yoga does not fit everyone. You know, it's not one size fits all. So that's why it's great to know a bit more about yoga before engaging in any practice, especially if you suffer from stress and anxiety. So stress is in the body, it's um, dysregulation in the brain. So we have something called the amygdala, that is like the alarm bell of the, of the brain. And for people highly anxious and stressed, uh, this amygdala is hyperactive. So for example, it means, let's say, you know, I just spill water on the floor. Someone, she will be like, oh, okay, you know, someone highly stressed will be like, <gasps> you know, like, and then palpitation and then running on in the mind, like, oh my God, what did I do? I shouldn't have done that, da, 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 da. So amygdala hyperactive, then it triggers something called the HPA axis. I'm not gonna go too long yeah. into that, but it's releasing cortisol in your body, which is the stress hormone. And when you have too much cortisol in the body, then it means your immune system is gonna decrease and you're gonna likely put on weight. So dysregulation of the hormonal system, I have so much things to say about all this. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I think that's interesting that to talk about the stress, what they call the stress sequence, right? Mm. There is like what we call the stressor, which is the event, the cause of the stress, right? So something's going to happen. And this is the, that's called the, the stressor. Then you have the nervous system, which is, in charge of interpreting what just happened, the event, right? But the actual, the result is the stress, what they call the stress response. And the stress response is really 
your interpretation of that event. So for example, like some guy would have lost his job and defined himself as his job for all his life. Like, let's say, you know, someone who's, when you tell him that he's fired, the stress response is going to be like so much more aggravated than for the same guy who would have put all his values into his family, for example, defines himself entirely different. So as a result of that, it's, it's kind of obviously, again, yoga, it's not one size fits all, but stress is also what is going to trigger our stress is entirely different from one person to the other. And it seems that it's just related so much to our own personal history and where we place our values and where, um, that that's the first thing I wanted to say. Yeah. And the second thing, it seems like as well, a lot of people who, who endure stress or endure really in the suffer from stress have had you know a build up an education a way of functioning values which have told them that they have to be resilient Mm -hmm. and their the threshold of where they can go how they're going to push themselves and to what extent you know might actually be so high that stress would be an indicator of, hey, this is where you have to stop. And instead, the values of these people exactly believe that, no, I have to endure, I have to keep on going. I should be able to to keep on going. Mm -hmm. And then, and this is what you're talking about. And so suddenly we are repressing, there's some kind of, it's like a cooking pot and it's gonna burst at some point. And the burnout and, yeah. the crisis and also the illnesses the true illnesses that we can talk about as well yeah i i just wanted to bounce back on the nervous system because it's something important we have uh, two nervous systems sort of uh, the parasympathetic nervous system which is the rest restore digest the cool nervous system and we have the sympathetic nervous system which is uh, fight or flight or freeze so stress response and what happens uh, with people suffering from stress and anxiety is that they're 90 or 80 percent of the time in the sympathetic nervous system. So it's always under pressure. The alarm is on. So everything is going on in the body as if you were ready to fight, you know, fight or flight. As if, you know, there was like thousands, millions of years ago, you know, people were just on alert because yeah they had to fight they had to like see tigers and go hunting and this kind of things but in our society we don't have such dangers but still we react the same way so yeah the immune system is decreased so then it leads of course to many illnesses and i also wanted to quickly mention the impact of stress on your digestive system because the enteric nervous system in your gut is also linked to your brain, to your automatic nervous system, and it communicates. So hence, many digestive issues when you have stress. And it can be as tiny as, okay, not so glamorous, but you know, diarrhea or constipation, and then worst case scenario, IBS and et cetera. So stress. And the cancer of the esophagus, um, the lining, it's, there are three um, main kind of, realm where stress affects our organs like directly so that's going to be like the spleen the the thymus the glands Mm -hmm. uh, and the lymphatic glands which are all linked to our immunity and our immune system so stress as a direct link to the lowering of our immune system the second part is the hormonal system that Mm -hmm. plays in everything all our responses and the the two hormones which are involved here are the cortisol and the adrenaline right and the third part is what you just talked about the third part is the lining of our guts the lining of the guts and like you know people who suffer from acid reflux like you know i'm talking chronically yeah and 
just think that oh it's okay it doesn't matter it's fine i'm gonna take like some okay. kind of medicine to <laughs> which is the same as using drug earlier as what you were saying right so in ayurveda so those three those three areas are clearly the enlargement of the adrenal glands the reduction of the immunity and all the sorts of um, illnesses that can come with the aggression made to the lining of the stomach and the, the whole system really. And obviously that gives ulcerations and esophagus. Um, I had a patient very much under stress, but interestingly, and that's the tricky part about stress. If you had asked this guy if he was under stress, oh, well, you know, it's good stress. Mm. It's good stress. This is what allows me to get things done. And this is what allows me to move ahead in life. Yeah. But actually, you know, this guy could not, cannot eat anything. He's just like, he spends five days in bed. He takes like, all theories of antacids and all the rest of it, which are also lowering the immunity. And, and suddenly it feels like he's literally allergic to any kind of food because the lining of the esophagus and the lining of the upper part of the stomach in his case is completely um, corroded by, by stress, literally. And this is proven scientifically. I mean, I mean it's not yeah. just, you know, but stress is inflammation, you know, and it shows in the body, as you said, as gastric reflux and also skin disease, such as psoriasis, eczema. So, and yeah. well, I'm going to lead you to Ayurveda. It's pita increase, you know, like fire, too much fire uh, in so, the body. Yeah, pita would be um, really branded with stress mm -hmm. and cortisol. So, for example... Like when I have a PETA individual, one of the requirements is like, you know, the, most of them all have like very intensive exercise practices. So that's going to be, you know, jogging like five times a week mm -hmm. or whatever is very intensive, except that every time, and that's interesting with your practices, every time you start breathing using your mouth, you know that you're going to start secreting cortisol pretty much. Yeah, because when you're... you practice exercise using your nose yeah. only, it's a kind of, it's a way to kind of keep the systems, you know, like slow and steady. Yeah. The PETA individual want to use their mouth, not that they want to use their mouth, but they want this intensive, this like release of adrenaline. But this adrenaline is also, but this, sorry, the whole thing also releases cortisol. And cortisol has a direct, you know, effect on ex ulcerating the lining of the esophagus. And so a lot of the PETA individual have those kind of issues, which are like, you know, ulcerations and just what we talked about one second ago. Yeah, and I can totally relate because I'm still PETA, you know, I just keep it... <laughs> Uh, I manage it sort of, but um, in the past I was this pita person and also with eating disorders, I was running every day. I was, and I thought I was described as a hyperactive person, dynamic, taking action, which is praise in our society. And that's the issue a bit because, you know, if you're like going for it, a go-getter and uh, moving fast and dynamic and doing so many things, being busy and da da da, then it's like, wow, you can do so much. But what is really happening is that I felt I was high on adrenaline, you know, and stress was just kicking in and I felt like, phew, I can do anything. The issue was that I would run on adrenaline and stress for several days, weeks, and then I would crush, you know, like <clears throat> deep pressure, like the pressure going off. And as you mentioned, when you ask people, are you stressed? No, no, you know, like, no, I just like to do a lot of things. So... It's tricky because when you meet someone stressed and anxious, it's either they don't want to get out of stress because it's like their go-to for running life, you know, like uh, using stress as a pusher, as a kicking in, or something super tricky too that I've seen with uh, some patients is that they look very calm on the yeah. appearance and deep inside, it's like 
like boiling, you know, and the monkey mind going on, the restless thoughts, uh, ruminative mind. And I was like this, you know, like on the outside, people used to tell me, oh, you look so calm, so contained, you know, you're, you're always so peaceful. Like, uh-uh, I was not. So, yeah, you, 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 might, think, yeah, Sorry. you, might, you might think you're not stressed, but, you know, like, have a look at it. How are you feeling right now? It's really the question I ask you, uh, all of you watching. <laughs> yeah. They actually, like in some studies, they realize that um, they find like, well, there is a definition again that goes back to what is the definition of stress, but it's pretty much the alteration of our normal system, bodily functions, if you wish. And they found in some studies that a person who was submitted to a general anesthetic actually shows even under anesthesia, complete anesthesia, shows like symptoms of clinical stress. I mean, you know, the, the cells are just exactly, you know, have all this um, behavior that's, that's symptomatic to stress. Yeah. So indeed, stress is not necessarily something we're conscious of. Yeah. And again, to go back to that definition, you know, it's not just the worst events in our life it's that chronical kind of like disturbance made to the system that's resisting you know yeah. i mean they found that in english language the word stress was used in engineering for like a very long time before we you know we made it like a medical kind of and and it's pretty much the, the elastic bands you know that you pull on, pull on, pull on, pull on, and at some point, it's going to snap. Yeah. And that's what the engineering definition of stress is, which is applicable, obviously, to yeah, what absolutely. we do here. Yeah. And there's one thing I've asked myself once, you know, because recovering or, yeah, overcoming stress and anxiety was really a step-by-step -step journey. Uh, it started with stopping any hyperactive activities, so stopping the running. Then I started yoga, which was excruciating for me. Uh, but I was challenging myself to just do the contrary of what I used to in the past because it did not work anymore, so I had to change. So stopping the hyperactivity. And then when I started yoga, I started to have this awareness that my mind, my thoughts, what's going on up there is not true. You know, it's not the reality. So I started to have this clear distinction between my thoughts and my self, whatever, you know, we believe in inner self, in yoga, higher self, soul, whatever you, you want to illustrate it with. So this distinction, but still, despite the fact that I had this distinction uh, between the mind and myself, I was still, I liked stress because oh. I was, it helped me a lot. I was, you know, like still doing a lot of things to stress. So I really had to challenge myself to slow down, to change my yoga practice, you know, like to really go towards more calming yoga practice. Uh, my yoga therapy course, of course, helped a lot because we're not yoga teachers, you know, we were yoga therapists. So I had to, to go through the journey as well. Mm. And, um, and I still have stress every day. And it's really a choice. Do I want to go in that direction? Do I want to go for that coffee, that chocolate that I know is going to give me hyper? Or, you know, can I just like take five minutes, just lie on the ground, do nothing and just breathe? So it's, uh, it's really finding the balance. I'm not saying stress is bad, you know, like you can use it. It's just being aware of it and know when you really need it and when you can avoid it and keep it balanced. Yeah, it's all about balance anyway. I mean, I, can, I come from that, you know, I was like a movie producer and I was working 12 hours a day and I was in conference call at 10 p.m. and I didn't have time for my daughter and I felt guilty and, and I really thought that it was just the way life was supposed to be and what was expected of me. And I kept on going and kept on going and I had a burnout and I stopped everything like this career. And I just, that's how I ended up in India and, and Ayurveda was the only thing that cured me, but I had put on 15 kilos on, which they called the X syndrome. And that's also related to cortisol, mm -hmm. the same thing. Yeah. And, and the problem, like in my practice, in my Ayurvedic practice now, I realized that 
you know, you ask people, do you live? Oh, but I don't want to live where I live. So why don't you live somewhere else? Well, and they look at, oh yeah. Why do you? It's kind of like not being able to question the whole lifestyle and priorities. Yeah. And I think this is, this is really the crucial thing. I mean, we, like the people who suffer from stress the most are people who are not able to say no most of the time. Finally, no to themselves, no to others, obviously. They're not able to put like clear boundaries around them because they believe that they are expected to function that way. Yeah. And then by minute, like, you know, my pita, we were talking about stress in Ayurveda, stress is pita, it's the fire. But anxiety is more vat, vata, what you were describing earlier, like going in all direction, that, not knowing, you know, like, or, or being like solicited here, there, go left, right, and all of this. And, and the connection between pita and, and vata is extremely, um, you know, organic and, and insidious again, because one is air and fuels the fire, you know, and, and so, we say stress, stress and anxiety for a reason because really they are they are linked together. But this addiction to stress, and we find some people. I have some patients who are telling me. I say, just do a yoga class, go to a Yin yoga. And I know that you have something to say about that. Actually, that's very yeah. interesting. <laughs> but I tell them go to a Yin yoga, and and they are just like, oh, but I'm so bored. I can't do it. It's just it's not for me. And it's very funny how you realize that those people who were hated the most needed the most. Yeah. I mean, that's truly... And isn't it often like this? And that's what I learned, you know, when we did the Ayurveda training together in India uh, back in 2017. Uh, once uh, Dr. Vinod said, it's what you're attracted the most that you should avoid, you know. I I'm Vata Pita and I love the spicy food, the light food like salad, and especially now it's summer. And I know I should go for more kava food, and more seeds, grounding. Like you know, a like, little bird. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah, that's what my dad says. But instead I should go for potatoes, more oily food. And, and I don't even like that, you know, but I, I force myself because what is told to you up there is not necessarily the best, you know. And that's what I love about yoga because the more you practice, the more you develop your spirituality, connection, whatever you call it the more you're able to distinguish, you know, like, is that coming from the mind or from the heart, the soul, my inner self, you know? So it's really a thin line, but uh, very interesting yeah. to develop and nurture. Yeah, I think we live in a crazy world anyway. I mean, we do live in something that's highly dysfunctional at all levels. I mean, let's not in get into politics here, but <laughs> something is utterly uh, insane. And I do believe that our lifestyles are insane. And if we don't question those to start with, I mean, there is no chance for a better world. Like, yeah. Let's start with how we experience all of this. Berenice, can you explain to us, like, uh, how does a session of therapeutic yoga work? Mm, and yes. what do you do? I know that you take patients, like, one-on-one -on -one mostly. Yeah. And you also have, we, we're going to talk about everything that you have to offer. I mean, we can... You have a group on Facebook where we can find you about stress and anxiety, actually. Yes. Yeah. For whoever wants to find you, actually, on my Facebook, on the announcement of this talk, all your links are there. So we can find you on YouTube, on your website. You are writing a book about yoga for beginners. Yeah. You are giving classes to yoga for beginners online on YouTube, I think, okay. right? And so tell us about how yoga therapy works if I come to see you and I need help. So first of all, I will send you questions, you know, to get to know you a bit more and to see, uh, well, if I can help you first, because I'm not God, you know, I cannot help everyone. <laughs> and then um, I will have a first call with you, like introduction call, 20 minutes-ish. And uh, just to explain you what is yoga therapy, what it is not. And also explaining you that... I'm not a guide, uh, we are co-creating the sessions together. So we establish a plan together, the priorities. So let's say you want to work on your first lower back pain, then anxiety, and then digestive issues. So with all this information, I would build a therapeutic plan, uh, including 
yoga poses, breathing techniques, meditation, and intuition is also a big part in yoga therapy. So, you know, the session happens, I have my plan, but it somehow changes all the time because sometimes I feel someone wants to talk more, so I listen to him or her more. Sometimes there's a bit of inquiry, asking questions, you know, to reflect. So it's, it's really building this relationship, this safe space where you feel held and secure and safe enough to share and where I give you the tools, I help you the best I can and where, well, I would say healing happens. Um, it doesn't happen in one session. Uh, I really recommend at least six sessions and, um, and then to do it regularly. So I have uh, weekly or bi-weekly sessions with my clients and it works really well. I also provide recordings of the session. So if I lead a meditation, often I record it so that you know, yeah. can practice at home. You have home practices as well, uh, recommendations. And, and you know, then it's really up to the person to, to do the work, to, to take care of him or herself uh, and to go for it. I, I'm just here to help, to give the tools, but I cannot do any more. And yeah. And that's how it works. Um, yeah. I should also mention, we mentioned earlier, like, you know, how the hormonal system is affected by stress and anxiety and the adrenal gland specifically, and specifically the pituitary gland, which mm -hmm. is like really the yogic um, hormonal gland, right? Yeah. And it is in charge of deciding of the levels of cortisol in the system, the cortisol we just talked about so much. And I suddenly, when you know that, the obvious link between yoga and meditation and, you know, the management of stress and anxiety becomes completely obvious. I mean, if it's not... So, because you're also... I didn't mention that at the beginning, but you're also a meditation teacher. Yeah, yeah. So, for you, it's quite easy to include the breathing breathing techniques and stuff like that into your practice of therapeutic yoga and that's the first step actually because the first session really is uh, to get to know the person a bit more and to observe the breathing you know how it works because um funny thing is not so funny but stressed out or anxious people they are clavicular breather and chest breather you know the breath doesn't go down in the belly so it's really rediscovering simple tools such as your breath and to come back to a more parasympathetic uh, nervous system so more rest relax restore uh, and to decrease the fight or flight nervous system so breathing is a big thing and then it's not going to be crazy yoga you know it's going to be very gentle movements uh, synchronizing the breath with the movements in the first session and then a gentle relaxation as for relaxation it's something to be very careful with because you might imagine someone is stressed out, anxious. You just, you know, like get him to lie down for 20 minutes, body scan, like, you know, the music, the flute, whatever. Uh -uh. <laughs> because that's the mistake I make when I tell my guy, oh, just go to a yin yoga. You know, it's like the guy is like so up there and so high on stress and cortisol again and adrenaline. And I asked him to go do a yin yoga. So what shall I ask him? What should I tell him except for calling you? <laughs> well, what would you do to convince this guy that he needs to? I will tell him to start with vinyasa yoga because pita people love to be challenged. They love to move. They love to sweat. And that's okay. You know, like you, you need also a bit of that in life. Uh, as yeah like moving uh as a first step to you know when you feel antsy sometimes you just want to jump to move to dance to just let it out well vinyasa yoga would be uh, the place for them to just let it out and at the end of any yoga practice anyway there's the shavasana you know at least 10 minutes relaxation so yeah. that's when it's really like entering the layer of the body the anamaya to go back to yeah the energy body and then the emotional mental body to just calm it down so first uh, you access the body to then impact and relax the rest um when i was that pita person my first yoga classes were actually vinyasa classes and i swear the first four times in a row that i went to that very same class and it's this is still my teacher mm. I cried every time 
the first the first four times in a row I cried. I there was so much release yeah. on that yoga mat. So much. It was just like and I was not able to pinpoint what was I crying about. Yeah. Something was just deep inside that needed to come out. Yeah. Well, the yeah. body stores everything, you know, it's our best encyclopedia. Uh, <laughs> if you don't feel well, uh, that's what I love to guide my client with, you know, just sitting down and feeling the emotion. Where is it? Does it have a color, a temperature? Just a bit of inquiry, because then it brings you back to the memory and often the, you know, the, the root of the problem. Uh, I also cried in yoga the first few times. So I thought, I think that's why I came coming back because I was like, huh, that's weird. Yeah, me too. There's something happening. Like, I don't know what it is, but I'm curious. Me too. So no relaxation. And for someone anxious, it's really building the grounding, the safe space where they feel like, okay, uh, here it's safe. Here I can relax a bit more. Because mm. if you go for, yeah, too much relaxation, too suddenly, too soon, it's going to be dangerous for them. I mean, it was for me. Um, so that's why, yeah. I, I really don't appreciate, you know, like yoga teachers being all about like, just relax, relax, mm. relax. Like, you don't know who's in the room, you know. It's not so easy to tell people to relax when they feel highly stressed. And it adds even more, more stress because what happens in the mind of the stressed person is like, oh, I'm here, uh, I'm stressed. And then you have the teacher, just relax. And then it's like, yeah. shit, I cannot relax. Uh, oh my God, I should relax. And you know, like <laughs> going on and on and on. So grounding and for grounding, what is a great tool, great, great, great. It's just your breath because your breath is accessible to you anywhere, anytime. And you have control over your breath. And that's what the yogi says, you know, like, control over your breath it's control over your body and eventually your emotions and pita loves control the people who suffer the most from stress are the people who want to be in control this loss of control is just the worst nightmare for them yeah. my my case study like not case study it's a patient but mm -hmm. the one i mentioned as a case study earlier very briefly it's quite interesting i believe uh highly demanding job, 12 hours in the office, performance-driven job. Uh, when I ask him about his diet and when he eats and what and when and whatever, so he has a breakfast, but then, and this is a person who has severe esophagus um, ulcerations to the point, if you wish, that this man is in bed every other week and is not able to function. And he takes like antacid and anti-inflammatory about six a day to be able to go through with his life. And he's been sick for over a decade, right? He's seen every type of doctors, everything you want. Nothing happens. Ayurvedic diet, first of all. And I think this is helpful for whoever is listening to us in terms of going against fire, going against you know, reducing pita stress is a pita, you know, substance in a way. It's a fire driven substance. So no spicy foods, less acidic foods, no tomatoes, for example, these kind of small things. In terms of lifestyle, this guy was running an hour every day, five to six days a week. And I suddenly tell him, you have to run maximum once or twice a week. <gasps> but you take away all my pleasure. How am I going to do? But he was so sick that it was easy for him to comply because Pita is one good thing. Pita is orderly and driven. And when you tell them to do something, they will. So they actually have a lot of success in terms of healing. And part of the lifestyle recommendation was to go in nature as well, mm -hmm. you know, like, and breathe. Go in nature and after three months, this, this guy at a specific and favorite tree in the park was suddenly having lunch with his family, which for the last 20 years, had never eaten at lunch for, with his family. Wow. And suddenly he's like having lunch. He's like suddenly, you know, and he tells me how he's suddenly much more able to handle his boss and the reactions he has to what was. So again, stress response. What's going to be the stress response? So a grounding, 
sugar base. When I say sugar base, I mean natural sugar, mm -hmm. sugars, such as, you know, rice, mung beans, potatoes, sweet potatoes, Dates. sweet, calms down pita. Yeah. And vata as well, by the way. So it's very good for anxiety. So natural sweets, mm -hmm. nature, like it's prescribed in the Sharaka Samrita, the founding text of Ayurveda. When you suffer from that, it's prescribed to have a walk under the moon with your lover. Mm. Isn't it sweet? That's beautiful. Especially in the summer with all the sun there. Oh, yeah. love it in the air. <laughs> No, it's, uh, yeah, breathing in nature. Nature is grounding, you know, like just putting your feet on the ground. Um, swimming. I mean, I'm so blessed to live where I do. Swimming, I yes. Swimming and ground myself tai chi, in the sea. Tai Qi. Qigong, and, all uh, these soft activities. Slow, gentle yoga. I'm not going to tell you to go for fully in yoga where people hold poses between, you know, like two to ten minutes. But, you know, like more restorative yoga. And your breath. Um and the practice of breathing doesn't come like this, you know, it's the same. Daily practice a little bit, uh, do it no matter what, even if the monkey man is like, oh, that's bullshit, it doesn't work, just keep showing up, just do it. Because by controlling your breath, you can really control your response, yourself, your emotions, your body. Um, it's, it is said that inhalation is the sympathetic nervous system. So, you know, fight or flight, a bit of stress, and exhalation is uh, parasympathetic, so more calming, relaxing. So by the simple fact of elongating your exhalation, having longer exhalation, you're calming your nervous system down. So that's very powerful. Um, and really my first practice with people is to go back to belly or abdominal breathing. Just get your breath down if you can. And, you know, go back to your natural breathing. Like when we were babies, we were just breathing with our bellies and... Uh, we have so many nerves, you know, in the belly, in the gut, that uh, by getting the breath down, we're just like relaxing them. And then it's like, it sends calming signals into the whole body. So yeah, your breath. There was a time in my life, uh, my stressed life, not that I'm completely cured, let me tell you, but <laughs> Hi. There, was a time, <laughs> there was a time where I actually put like four um, alarm on my phone four times a day just to check on where I was breathing, just a reminder. And it seems like a bit weird, but actually it was just working wonders. It was kind of a, I only did it four times because I was in an office environment and all the rest was a bit disturbing to others, but it was so helpful to just catch up with myself. Like, oh, I'm breathing here, shallow breathing. I'm like, just take and exhale for longer you know yeah. and that was so helpful yeah and it's very good that you had this awareness and this willingness also to to take charge of your stress with your breath yeah it is because if there's a bit of willingness anything can happen i believe so yeah i was sick already i guess that's why i was like willing to go there yeah Berenice, unfortunately, we could have talked for two hours that's the problem with those talks we said yeah. 45 minutes we're at 50 now um let's breathe what about breathing together yes can you tell us before we go there can you tell us what you have upcoming like if people want to can you tell us where are your events if any or what's going on in terms of what you're offering mm, well just not so many events uh face to face not this yeah. at least yeah. um but um well Posting videos every week on YouTube to help people practice, especially beginners. Uh, thank you, Roman. She said it was very interesting. And then, uh, well, if you're curious and if you want to check uh, yoga therapy, have a call with me. Just go on my website where have, uh, have you have it in your in your in your description. Yes. And uh, we'll see. You know, I'm I'm preparing things in the background. Uh, so I will tell more when it's ready. I don't like to. Okay. <laughs> and I think like what I would really like to do, and I think because I already had some people interesting, interested, I think we, in September, if you're up for it, we should do something about um, anorexia and mm -hmm. bulimia. Yeah. Because I think it's very helpful to all the young ladies out there, mostly, um, you know. Yeah. That would be amazing. 
And I'm really happy to share about it and to share a message of recovery because um, it's still, I think, taboo. Uh, not so much is known about it and there's not so much hope. So I'm really, yeah. And how Thank yoga you. can help. And, and, and so Yes, on. okay. Great. Let's do this. Yeah. Will you drive us, run us through like a small practice that we can take away home? Yes, so anyone uh, watching us, if you can, well, actually you can do it uh, anywhere. Um, and it's really two minutes practice of breathing and it's very grounding, very helpful. And if you feel like all over the place, overwhelmed, that's my go-to, you know, like to come back to my breath and whew, feeling more calm and grounded. So take any comfortable seated posture and just try to keep your spine nice and straight. And uh, yeah, how is your breath right now? Just feeling your natural breath without changing anything, without controlling or trying not to, and relaxing your shoulders away from your ears, relaxing the muscles of your face. Feel free to close your eyes or keep a soft gaze. Just take a couple of breaths, natural breath. And then we're going to practice three part breath or dirga breath, which consists in breathing in three parts in your body. So when you are ready with your first inhale, breathing in your belly and then posing, inhaling a bit more, breathing in your chest and posing, breathing a bit more if you can, up to the clavicles and posing, and a deep long exhale through the nose. And two more time on your own. And with your legs exhale, staying a bit here if you can, if you have the time. Coming back to your natural breath and perhaps feeling the sensations in your body, what's happening now. No judgment, no analyzing, just feeling. And when you're ready, when you feel like it, gently flickering your eyes open. Very nice. Just that. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Thank you so much. Mm. Namaste, sister. Namaste. You've just joined the tribe. And I hope it will grow. And, you know, I hope we can spread the good words yeah. and help some people who are looking for alternatives. Yeah. To... Um, yeah, we, we still have four minutes. Can we just uh, have a bit of bit disclosure how we met and... <laughs> I don't think we have four minutes. It was it was supposed to be finished eleven minutes ago. Okay. <laughs> no, but who cares? Yeah. Okay. Who cares? Who whoever is interesting. Uh, Evan, I met um, in India. Uh, we were the only two people joining that course, and um, oh, that's right. Oh, yeah, wow. we were just the two of us, and uh, you had just left your career, I think. Yeah. I had left, I was, I was 15 kilos overweight. I just had gone through a burnout that I was not aware of. The only thing that was giving me pleasure was actually yoga. Mm -hmm. And I thought, mm, and, and Ayurveda. And Ayurveda, I started like healing me a bit. And this is why I went to India to keep on this healing journey. And you were there for... Ayurveda, and then you did meditation. Yeah, the the first training was yoga, and then <coughs> I thought yoga my yoga training for one month, and I thought I would just travel around India after that. And actually, I decided to stay in Rishikesh and to go for Ayurveda because there was so much more to learn. And yeah, uh, yeah that's how we met, and uh, it was a funny journey because we just met again and you know like i moved to london at one point and we we're almost neighbors so it's how it's just beautiful how we remain connected all the way and 
Yeah. yeah, I think on those, I was, I wrote on my blog, like something that's called the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And it's just that I found so many patients. It's like from Joseph J. Campbell, who, who studied the myth of the hero, the mythical heroes, and how they all have like, you know, an initiative period and then a return to themselves and whatever. And I think we were on that journey, really. And it's a very... It's a long journey, but it's a journey that you can apply to, to changing lives and to also um, to the healing. The healing journey is a journey that's a difficult one. It it's is. a hero's journey. It's like facing again your being able to face your crap, really, and, yeah. and changing things. And it's difficult. It's difficult because it questions everything that you believed in. Yeah, it's shaking your whole world upside down. You know, it's really, you, I think in life you have two options. Either you put the dust under the carpet, you know, like, yeah, everything is fine. Or, yeah, you have the courage to take steps to face your shadows. And, yeah, yeah. it's challenging, but it's so rewarding and uh, it's worth it. So Yeah. yeah. And now that we have one minute, one minute left on yeah. our extended time, in French, I just want to say that this talk, well, no, actually, I'm saying it in English, that this talk will happen en français this coming Monday. Is it this coming Monday? On the 5th of July. Yeah. At the same time. We're going to do this in French because, parce que nous avons beaucoup de Françaises qui aimeraient bien savoir de quoi on parle. And that's difficult to follow in English. So let's do this again. Thank you so much, Berenice, for everything well, thank, thank you, you for everybody who was with us yes and next week we having a talk on oh an interesting one about talk about becoming yourself or really living your truth exactly that's cool with rachel rachel has been six months in tiknat and monastery in france and she's a musician And she went through her hero's journey as well. And so I'm sure that would be probably very interesting as well. So thank you, everyone. Mm. Anybody with questions? I should have asked this. Yeah, do we have questions? No, I'm just quickly, that was interesting. Oh, Aurélie, one of my good friends joined. Hi, Aurélie, if you're still here. And someone said uh, that she enjoys following YouTube. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you, Sonia. Well. Yeah, we forgot about questions. We forgot about everything. There is no structure to this thing. This is wonderful. It was supposed to be a casual talk. Look, it is a casual talk. And no, Alex is here. No filter. <laughs> yeah, right. no, no filter. Why taking ourselves seriously? Nothing. <laughs> a big kiss to everyone. Thank you, Berenice, Thank again. You. Merci. Thank Namaste. You. Gros bisous. Thank you so much. À lundi. <laughs> And see you, see you Monday. Yeah.